Good afternoon and thank you for joining me. My name is Chrissy and I am a monthly video contributor to Mental Health on the Mighty. Today, I first I'm going to introduce myself. I know that it takes a few minutes for people to come on to the video, um, but today I am going to talk about a topic that's pretty sensitive for me and I know many of us that live with mental illness. Um, first, let me tell you a little bit about who I am. Uh, my name is Christy Hodges. I'm a mental health advocate. Uh, particularly, I talk about OCD. The type of OCD I live with is typically com or commonly referred to as pure OCD. It's a community name for people who experience sexual, violent, blasphemous, intrusive thoughts and have mostly mental compulsions. <clears throat> I do consultations for therapist referrals worldwide and I'm a certified peer support specialist and I work to support and normalize what people are going through. I'm also an author of Pure OCD, The Invisible Side of Obsessive Compul Compulsive Disorder. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I think that you probably know why I'm doing this video today. Um, not just because of what's happened and the tragedies that have occurred here in America over the last few weeks months um when things like this happen it affects me really deeply not just for the people that are affected but also as a person who lives with a mental illness because as we all know as a community we have a tendency to all of a sudden be put at the forefront of why these things happen so today I'm going to talk to you about how it makes me feel. I'm not here to talk about facts and myths and arguing. I am going to talk about facts, but I'm not here to argue. I'm not here to convince people. I'm not because I know there's enough of that going on in social media. I'm here to talk about what happens to me, how I feel when this happens, how it impacts my life, my recovery, my ability to handle stigma and all of the emotions that I feel about the people who are saying such nasty things about individuals that live with mental illness, which includes me and includes many of you. This video was inspired a lot by a, a, an article that was posted on The Mighty yesterday. Mental Health on the Mighty, and it was about violence and mental illness. And I went down to the comments and I just thought, why did you go down to the comments? And just some of the misguided things that people were saying and just nasty things on a page that is supportive of mental illness and abolishing stigma. And I'm not blaming Mental Health on the Mighty, trust me. I just thought, why in the world? What's the point? So this is how I feel. First of all, my recovery story includes a very long period of dealing with stigma. Dealing with the myths that surround mental illness once I became someone who could identify as being mentally ill. Which I lived with an illness for 12 years and didn't know. And then when I was diagnosed and treated effectively, that's not where things ended for me. I dove into all of the myths that much of society believes that people with mental illness are lazy and people with mental illness are weak and maybe you should just get out and do this and you should, you know, do something else and then you won't have symptoms or that we're violent or we're damaged goods or whatever else. I fell victim to those things because I was grieving. And I was dealing with the huge emotions that come along with having a mental illness. And for years, I didn't believe the myths, but I just let that stuff build up inside of me. I thought to myself, well, who's going to hire me if they know? Who's going to love me if they know <laughs> what I went through? And especially a suicide attempt and hospitalization and the intrusive thoughts that I live with. Who's going to accept me? And then came the shame and the guilt of, well, nobody's really ever going to know who I am because I can't share this story with people and let them into this experience that I had 
just one more reason why stigma is so detrimental. I was lucky to move through that and be able to reach an emotional recovery over a decade later thanks to peer support, thanks to meeting people who helped me identify that those emotions were okay. But here's one of the things I wanna drive home before I get to my experience when I hear about these tragedies and the backlash that the media gives us. Individuals with a mental illness are not dangerous, but the myths surrounding individuals with mental illness being violent are dangerous. That's what should we should be preaching. That's what we need to be posting in the media. Let me just tell you why it's dangerous. <laughs> it creates fear. It creates shame. It creates guilt for these things that we didn't ask for. It creates negativity around something that none of us want and we would give back if we could. So what happens when we have this big melting pot of negative emotions surrounding something we're trying to survive? What happens when that happens? We become isolated. We, be, we don't want to talk to people. We become fearful. We become shamed. Then we become deeper in our symptoms. Depression can happen. Depression can worsen. Suicidal thoughts can happen. But ultimately, the worst, most damning thing that can happen is that people stop asking for help. Why don't people ask for help when they have mental health issues? Because they don't want people to know? Because of these horrible myths that go around about how dangerous we are. We could snap at any minute and just murder everybody in the room. That is the most dangerous thing, the myths, not the individuals. So for me, when I hear about this, when I wake up and I see what's happened, first I feel horrible for the people involved in the tragedy. I feel grateful that my family is near me and safe. And that I didn't have to be involved, but I feel terrible for the people. But second, I just brace for it. Everybody wants to find the reason. Everybody wants to know why. So they can pinpoint the farthest thing away from them. Is it guns? Is it politics? Oh, wait, no, it must be mental illness because I don't, I'm not mentally ill and neither is anybody in my family or friends. Yeah, right. You just don't know it because they don't tell you because you're judgmental. <laughs> That's just the bottom line. Sorry, it's true. But my first feeling is helplessness. Why? I know the backlash I'm about to face. Part of me has come to this conclusion of when this happens, I just don't get on social media. And that's not fair. That's not fair. That's right when an advocate should be there, right? But I can't handle it. I can't handle every post I scroll down. There's a meme about mental illness. There's a report about mental illness that, oh, we just need better mental health care in America and then this stuff wouldn't happen. Let me tell you something. If you want to know a truth and not a myth, you can have the best mental health care at your fingertips that you could walk out your door and walk in that door and get the best treatment ever, but no one's going to do it if we're stigmatized. Why? Because no one will ask for help if they feel stigmatized against. And if they have to admit, I have a mental illness, that means I'm violent. So your plan backfires. It backfires. And the only people that suffer are us. Us. The most violent Violence I know that has to do with mental illness is the violence we do against ourselves. That's what we need to focus on. That's why at points I can't have a gun. I get suicidal. I can't have that liability of hurting myself. Those are the facts. The next thing I feel is hopeless. I usually scroll for a little bit and then I start feeling hopeless. As an advocate, 
I'm, you know, I'm in my little bubble, so I'm surrounded by a lot of people like all of you out there that are supporting me and that support each other. And I feel like we make this progress. And I know we're making progress. And I know that you just keep pushing. But then when this stuff happens, I feel hopeless. Because then all it takes is one politician. And no, I'm not just talking about the person in the White House right now. I'm talking about all of them. That would rather face or would rather put the issue onto something like mental health and then do shit about it than actually look at other issues. They need some place to blame too. But I feel hopeless when I see people who are our leaders saying, oh, it must be mental health. It makes me think, what are we doing this for? If, it could be, if every moment of progress can just be wiped away with one tweet, with one journalist writing out there because that journalist thinks that they know so much more than everybody else about mental health. It makes me feel hopeless. The next is it makes me feel angry. One of my favorite emotions, I'll be honest. But you know what? We aren't scapegoats. We're strong, resilient, Especially people out there speaking out are warriors for this cause. We are incredible people and that all gets lost in translation when you see headlines saying if we only had better mental health, this stuff wouldn't happen. Don't identify me with someone that would pick up a rifle and blow people away. Don't identify the hundreds of people that I know because of these platforms that I know wouldn't hurt anybody. Don't compare us to that. But even more so, it makes me angry because the people who the day before a tragedy are my friends on social media who are like, I'm so glad you do what you do, are the ones posting about it. They're the ones saying, if we only had better mental health. And I'm all, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were excited about the advocacy I was doing yesterday. Oh, but not you, Chrissy. You know those other people. I got news for you. I am those other people. I am those other people. And they are me. We are a community of people. I don't care what your diagnosis is. I don't care if it's psychopathy or schizophrenia or OCD or ADD or bipolar. We're all in this together. And we deserve support. And we deserve acceptance. And to be empathetic and kind to each other. Lastly, I feel scared. Scared for me, scared for you. Why? Because this goes back to my video when I did what I did about Chester Bennington when he when he died by suicide, and the biggest fear that went through my mind was, oh my gosh, like if if that could happen to someone like him, what if that could happen to me? And when something like this happens, and people who with OCD have violent intrusive thoughts, or with people who you know you know, may believe this myth, you know, or, or may have just been duly diagnosed with, with mental illness. And they hear this and they think, oh my gosh, could that be me? Is that what's in store for me with mental illness? I'm just going to snap one day and kill a bunch of people because that's what people with mental illness do. It makes me feel scared. Because again, it perpetuates the idea that people aren't going to ask for help. They won't ask for help. They won't tell their families. If their families are online posting, oh, the shooters are mental, they, they're mentally ill. And that's why if, if a son or a daughter or a niece or a nephew, if they're diagnosed with OCD or bipolar or any, you know, any illness whatsoever, they're not going to ask for help. They're going to stay silent. And what did I say earlier? Silence breeds isolation, stigma, shame, embarrassment, guilt, all of the above, which leads to more depression, more symptoms, suicidal thoughts.
The bottom line is stigma is real. And when this happens, it makes me feel stigmatized. And I don't often feel stigmatized anymore. I lay it all out there. If you've seen my YouTube channels, you know. But this always, I even anticipate it. It's going to make you feel like this, Chrissy. It's going to make you hurt. You can get through it. You can, you can educate people. <laughs> but it's so much easier, isn't it, for people just to say, it's those people over there. I can't drive this home the most. Those people are me. Me. You. My best friends. My colleagues. Your best friends, colleagues, family members. We are everywhere. We are those people. Don't put us in a box. Listen to how it feels for us. And for those of us, or for those of you that are watching, and you're just going to blast me in the comments or whatever, <laughs> and you think, oh, whatever, one girl's opinion, it doesn't matter, I want facts. Well, okay, then take the time and look up the facts. Don't go to some biased reporting crap. Here are a couple links, or here are a couple names you can look up. Jeffrey Swanson, professor of psychiatry and behavior scientist at Duke University. He is a specialist in gun violence and mental illness. Look him up, Jeffrey Swanson. Go to NAMI, the National Alliance of Mental Illness. Look up studies that have been done. If you need facts, there are facts out there. The facts are not on social media. They're not going to be on any news network because they're just looking for reasons and excuses that are going to work right now. If you want facts, find the facts. Listen to our stories. I want to just say one more time because this is the most important part of this whole video. We are always calling for better mental health when these huge violent things happen. And it makes us all cringe. There's a difference in someone being mentally disturbed, which can happen for a lot of reasons. Anger, rage, trauma, um, money issues, family issues, violence, history of violence, all of this stuff. Okay? There's a difference between that and someone with a diagnosable mental illness. I don't know about y'all, but when you're in your symptoms, I mean, I can't calculate and plan and execute a mass shooting. I couldn't. It's impossible. The only person I would hurt is myself because I feel horrible about myself. <laughs> you know, it's, it's people don't understand because they don't understand illnesses. They don't understand symptoms. They just think these major mental illnesses, they equal crazy people and crazy people can snap and do something. Learn the facts. The whole point of all this is this. You are calling for better mental health. I could have a mental health service right down the street that I could walk into and get service at my fingertips, but I'm not going to do it if you keep calling me a killer. I'm not going to do it if you keep spreading myths that aren't true about mental illness. And that's just me. I guarantee you, most people with mental illness wouldn't. The shame is real. The fear is real. The embarrassment, the guilt, it's all real. Stop fueling it. Stop it. Get to know us. Get to know our stories. Get to know the facts. That's how I feel. How do you feel? Because I am here today to help normalize what most of us go through. I know a lot of people don't, you know, with this, but most of us go through this every time this happens and we feel helpless. We feel hopeless. We feel scared. I'm right there with you. And I want to encourage this community for us to band together and to support one another and to come out 
with a strong voice against this because we are making progress even though weeks like this week feels like we're not. We can if we do it together. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you letting me tell my side of this and know that you know there might be some arguing of facts <laughs> in the comments here and that this video is not about that. It's about the experience of someone who lives with mental illness and is an advocate. And I hope that you'll take that into consideration. And I hope from here on and any time, we can move forward with this and help change minds and start changing the stigma surrounding mental illness. Thank you and I will see you next month. And have a lovely Thanksgiving.